Hey everyone, we're very excited to be at the Bartlett Center. Um, before I introduce Trevor today, next month we'll be back at the Downtown Library. It will actually be me um, talking about St. Joseph suffragists because this year is the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment. So that'll be very exciting. Um, but today we have uh, Trevor, who is the curator for the St. Joseph Museums, and he will be talking about Charles Baker, inventor of the friction heater. Thank you. Um, going to be talking into a microphone, but it's for the recordings, and so I will try to amplify my voice. Let me know if you can't hear me in the back. Um, so we are putting together an exhibit. It is actually open at the East Hills Mall right now called Boom, the Rise and Fall of Missouri's Black Business Districts. Um, talks, it's a traveling exhibit from the Missouri State Museum uh, talking about the black business districts in the early 1900s across the state of Missouri, which rose to prominence and then were um, kind of wiped out over um, due to redlining and other issues. Um, so with that exhibit, we wanted to focus on the black business districts in St. Joseph to tell our story. And each of those panels highlights a certain individual within the African-American community. Um, and so we decided to go with Charles Baker. Um, how many here actually know who Charles Baker is? Couple of you, that's better. Whenever I gave this uh, talk at Rotary earlier this week, nobody had heard of him. Um, he's kind of an enigma. Uh, he sort of flashes into the pages of history and then disappears. Um, so we've been trying to delve up as much as we can, figure out um, who he was, what his life was like, and then what happened. Um, so the original uh, image that I know of um, was at the Library of Congress. It was actually taken here locally at Fifth and Felix Street um, by a man named Martin W. Bodie. Um, and this is the image itself. This is Charles Baker here, and this is his invention, a friction heater. Um, we didn't know who this guy was, but we think we've identified him now, and I'll get to that later on. Um, the other primary or secondary source that we have is Alonzo's article from 2014. Um, he did a lot of the research um, and actually told the story really well. Um, it's a good starting point for us to start doing our research and trying to um, find more history on this person. Um, there is a biography written in the uh, Michigan Manufacturers newspaper in 1911, uh, and it actually talks about who Charles Baker was, tells his story, but it's actually more of a sales pitch. It's trying to sell the invention. Um, we'll get to it a little bit later as well, but there are some key points here which give us some threads to start pulling on. Uh, it says that Charles was born into slavery in Savannah, Missouri in 1859. Uh, we think it might actually be a little bit later, maybe 1861, but somewhere between 59 and 61 is whenever he was born. Um, it says that his mother died six months later. That's also possibly slightly skewed, but we'll try to figure that out. Um, and that he was raised by his mistress, Mrs. Sally Mackey. So that gives us a name to start trying to um, research and figure out uh, his connections there. Uh, it also says whenever he was 15 years old, he uh, traveled with his father. Um, his father, Abraham Baker, was a mail deliverer for the Nave McCord uh, Company. Um, and in the article, it says he made the country-long trek from Savannah to St. Joseph. I think either they didn't realize which Savannah they were talking about or um, meant county. I don't know. Um, but the story goes that while he was making this journey for the Nave McCord, um, he forgot to grease the wheel on the wagon, and the friction caused by the wagon wheel turning um, heated up the driver's seat so he couldn't continue on. Um, and then a rainstorm hit, and the rain fell upon the axle and created steam. And so that's the impetus of this idea to create steam heat through friction. Um, but it takes him many, many years before he finally settles down to um, start to work on this invention himself. Um, so we have some names, we have some starting points. We're trying to figure out where he was born, how he came to be here in St. Joseph, those types of things. So we start out with Abraham Baker. Um, the Andrew County Museum actually has a lot of information on him through their genealogist. Um, they've done a lot of research in the Baker family. They're very prominent in Andrew County. Uh, a Baker here is the only um, headstone in their family plot, but there are several family members buried there, including Charles himself, we believe. Um, so a little information here on Abe that we've been able to put together. Um, because he was so well known, his obituary has a lot of really good detail in it. Um, but he was born in Kentucky in 1821. 
10 years later, he and his master, Joseph Hunter, moved to Plattsburgh, Missouri, and they established the first hotel in Plattsburgh. So 10 years old, Abraham's working as a server at this hotel for uh, five years until they moved to Andrew County. They moved to Nottaway Township, which is actually closer to um, Amazonia, um, and just work as a farmer from then on out. This is actually the Laclede Hotel. It was built on top of the site where Joseph Hunter's hotel uh, was built. So it's not the original one that they worked at, but it's the same site. And that hotel still stands today in Plattsburgh, as far as I know, anyway. Um, so then I start diving into the censuses, the slave schedules. Um, again, unfortunately, they don't record. You can feel free. <laughs> yep. Unfortunately, they don't record names of slaves. They're only numbers. Um, but we can kind of get a general idea of where Abraham comes in to Andrew County through this. Um, Joseph Hunter shows up number 31 on the list down here in the bottom. Um, it has him listed as having 12 slaves. Um, one of them is a 50-year-old female. One of them is a 27-year-old female. The other one says 21-year-old male. If that one is actually a nine, <laughs> which it may be, it's kind of hard to read, but they generally go in order of age. Um, if it's meant to be 29, then that's probably Abraham. If not, either he's not here with Joseph or he may have already been freed. Um, we actually find the case of some freed African-Americans living in Andrew County around the same time period as well. So we know his father's family information. We have a hard time tracking down who is this Sally Mackey who apparently raised him. Well, on the same slave schedule, luckily, um, number four, if I can find where that's at. <laughs> I should have written down a little bit better. I think over here is a John O. Mackey. And so that's the first instance of a Mackey I can find. Um, and so I start delving into that. And we have the last will and testament of James Mackey, who is John O.'s father. And in 1857, James Mackey leaves everything to his son, James B. Mackey and John O. Mackey. Ironically, the exact same year, John O. Mackey writes his will up um, and he leaves everything to his wife, Sarah. And Sarah is likely a nickname being Sally, so therefore we can kind of understand that this is probably the family where Charles's mother came from. Um, 1860 slave schedules on the left there. Uh, Joseph Hunter's number one, again. Uh, he has a 25-year-old male, um, so definitely out of the age range for Abraham to be uh, with him at that point. But Sarah Mackey has um, a family Living with her, there is a 25-year-old female, which could possibly be the mother. Um, there is a six-year-old female, a four-year-old female, a three-year-old male, and a six-month-old female. So if Charles's birth date is 1859, he should be showing up on this under there, um, but he isn't yet. There is a six-month female. Um, whenever we start matching up family members later on, every one of those dates matches up with his older siblings. So it's highly likely that this is still the same family. Um, and then the census information has them. Um, Sarah is only 34 year old widow, uh, runs the farm herself. Uh, her brother lives nearby, so they have a large estate together. Um, Joseph Hunter is living alone um, and he's 63. So he's kind of on his way out um, back then. <laughs> so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 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 We'll get to some older folks here, it's <laughs> nice. Um, so these are some actual um, land records from 1870s, and Sarah Mackey shows up in the second plot. Again, it's really hard to see, but up in this area, there's two plots of land with S. Mackey listed. That's likely Sarah Mackey. Um, and also, uh, in this area over here, again, this is north of Amazonia. Up here is where the Mackey's land is. Over east of Fillmore, Andrew County, there's a family called C. Carriger, and that comes up, becomes important really soon. Um, so the Carringers here are African Americans. This is 1860 census. They own a large plot of land and have a large family living in Andrew County. Freed people living there. Um, whenever we go to 1870, uh, we have A. Baker. Uh, Abraham is living down towards, actually over here. Um, and it lists his entire family. Uh, he's been remarried at this point. We have his marriage license here in a bit uh, to a lady named Eva. And it lists all of their children. There's Suzanne, who's 15, Anne, who's 14, Peter, who is listed as 18. Again, probably not accurate. Uh, Ellen, who's 11, and Lewis, who is 9. 
Now, Lewis is actually Charles. Um, he doesn't go by Charles until he reach, reaches maturity, and then whenever you see his name is SL, that L is the Lewis. Um, there's another daughter, Margaret, um, and then they're living with Eva's sister and mother and Abe's mother, Dolly Baker, who is 70 at this point in 1870. Um, also listed in the 1860 census are more of the Carringer family. Up here at the top is Louisa, who is again widowed. Um, her daughter, Carrie, becomes Charles's wife. So we're able to track that. Um, there are three different families of Carringers probably living together. Um, again, they had that large plot of land. Um, this is all of Abraham Baker's land down here at the bottom uh, is some of his territory over by DeKalb County. Um, over here, uh, right next to, um, not Savannah, uh, Rochester in Andrew County, he has territory right here and he has two plots of land south of there as well. So they have quite a bit of land in Andrew County. Um, I think Charles maybe actually shows up at some point nearby as well. Um, so like I said, uh, Abram gets remarried. It's over here to Evie um, Ewing. And it lists that they have a daughter already named Patsy, which is one of the sisters, but doesn't list any of the other ones, which is interesting. It says from a previous marriage, whether it meant um, the rest of them or not, I'm not sure, but it lists only one. Um, and then in 1880, we still have this, the whole family together. Abe is least listed as the teamster because he travels with the um, wagon delivering mail. Um, and Dolly, his mother, is still living with them, and she is 90 years old in 1880. We'll skip an age, but we will get to why that's important in a bit. Um, Lewis is listed on that as 17 years old. In the end of that year, December 11th, he gets married in Corning, Iowa, and lists his age as 22. Uh, he gets married to Carrie Carringer. Uh, she's listed as 19 years old. Um, but he lists his father as Abe right there. His hometown is Savannah. And then Carrie lists her father as Caesar. Again, Caesar's dead at this point, but she has a brother named Caesar, so that helps us tie all the families together as well. Um, so they get married in Corning, Iowa. They have their daughter in 1881. Her name is uh, Lula Bell Baker, uh, Bell coming after Charles's sister, who also married into the Carringer family, so there's a lot of ties together there. Um, Lula Bell shows up various times as Lola Bell, as Bella, and variations of her name, so she's kind of hard to track, but we are able to track her through her life as well. Um, but they're living in Iowa at this point. It lists him, him as a printer whenever they get married. Uh, not too long after, they move back to St. Joseph. These are all the city directory entries of Charles Baker. Um, from 1887 to 1893, he's working as a mail, mail carrier still here in St. Joseph. He's living at 1109 Frederick Avenue. Um, from 1895 to 1901, he is an employment agent, um, essentially helping people get jobs. Um, and he moves around quite a bit during that period, it seems. And then 1902 to 1908, which is the years he starts to do his inventions, he's living at 2616 Locust Street. Um, around the 1890s, Charles decides, um, you know, like I said, he had a 90-year-old grandmother. Um, who ends up being the oldest living person in Northwest Missouri at the time of her death. She dies in 1889. Uh, so he's thinking about these old, these um, aging slaves. Um, a lot of them were living on the poor farm here in St. Joseph. Um, so he gathers a community, a committee together to um, build housing for them, essentially a retirement home for aged slaves. Uh, and this is kind of the beginning of his um, uh, his, his work um, helping the community, essentially. Um, so they, they raise a lot of money. There's a lot of news about it, talking about how he was able to raise money from across the world. He had bricks donated by nobles of the old world. So he had a lot of support for this. Um, land was donated to him at 17th and Highland there in, in 1894. Um, that building was finished. The first building of five planned was finished in 1896, and then a cyclone destroyed it. Um, so right as soon as they st got started, it got destroyed. This is actually that building, I believe, um, due to the date of the actual thing. We have this photo in the St. Joseph archives. Um, in 1897, a Dr. P.J. Kirshner um, was running for mayor. Uh, and so in December, he decides to donate uh, 24th and Mitchell um, to restart this um, 
this organization and to restart the construction of the home. So that home is built in 1898, only one building this time. Uh, Kirshner wins his mayoral election, and the next year the home closes. Um, Charles has kind of stepped away at this point. They were under new management. And things kind of fell apart after he was gone. Um, so, and this wasn't meant to just serve St. Joseph. This was supposed to be a nationwide home for ex-slaves to have a place to live. Um, and it just didn't support itself. Um, there was a lot of uh, local uh, wealthy people who were donating furniture and funds to it, but it just all fell apart. Um, like I said, Dolly Baker here. Um, she's in, nearing the end of her life, uh, claims to be 103 years old, um, super well known in Savannah. Uh, she passes away in 1889. Uh, her funeral is attended by thousands of people, black and white. Um, then his father also lived a very long time. Um, he would make annual trips to St. Joseph to talk with James McCord, the son of the original James McCord who founded the company, because they were friends. He, he grew up with his father. He would come back to tell him stories of the old days, um, and he knew all these founders of St. Joseph. Most of them, if you look at those land maps in Andrew County, a lot of the names of city founders started in Andrew County, or at least had land up there. So he was uh, dealing with them his entire life, and again, was extremely well known. Um, he dies in 1908. Um, and again, has a large article about him. He's 87 years old um, whenever he passes away. Um, so it's around uh, 1903, 1904, whenever Charles starts becoming an inventor. This is what he wants to do with the rest of his life. Um, the very first patent that he has here is for the electromechanical automatic signaling and collision uh, prevention device up here. So essentially it's just a box on a railway that would trigger whenever the car goes over it to let the next station know there's a car coming. So it prevents collisions. This is probably still in use. I don't know if it's his design or not. It probably got stolen like the rest of them, but I don't know. So it's really fascinating to see that he was already active in this field. Uh, 1904 is whenever he establishes the Baker um, Friction Heater Company. Uh, so this is whenever he really starts that idea of the friction heater. Um, this is the local article about it. Uh, then he got picked up in St. Louis. Uh, this is him, obviously. Um, and here he is demonstrating how it works. Essentially, you can see it's still like a wagon wheel. Um, but essentially, it would have wooden cores that he would load into a metal frame, and turning that core would create the friction heat, and then the metal would heat up, and then that would heat the, the water, which would create steam. Uh, he starts refining this design. Uh, he started out, him and his brother Peter, which is you know in the list of... of family members in the censuses. Um, him and his brother Peter would go over to Atchison, would go around Kansas, and they would just go to scrapyards and start putting this thing together themselves. Um, in this article, he's very, um, he, he makes a point to be like, this is my invention, no one's gonna take it from me. Um, people don't think that people of my race can come up with these ideas, but I assure you, like I put all my hard work, all my money, all my education into this process. Um, so he, He's very adamant that he's going to control this invention for the rest of his life, which he does. Um, again, this is the establishment of the Baker Heating Company. Um, it was had a factory at 611 Francis Street, and we'll see that today uh, later on. Um, and then he incorporates over in Jersey City um, with the longest company name ever, the Baker Revolutionizing Superheating Molecule, Molecule Union Developing Company. Um, so. He makes that, uh, he raises a bunch of money. You can see the people who incorporate it. There's Peter Baker, his brother, and Bella Baker Ellington, which is his daughter. So she's included on the list of founders whenever he starts these companies. Um, raises a lot of money. The one in Jersey City I did find popped up with some tax issues, um, but the rest of his companies, it's hard to keep track of corporate histories, how these things kind of fall apart. Um, as soon as he started the one here in St. Joseph, again, he had a lot of investors, and almost instantly, like 1906, they sue him for the patent, and he actually wins that in court and says, no, this is mine. Like, you don't have any rights to take this away, and I'm actually producing the, the product. Um, throughout 1906, him and his brother are testing the heater. They actually hook it up to rail cars, um, so the actual motion of the locomotion uh, fuels the heater and then creates heat for all, all the cars. And the Santa Fe line, all the big railroad companies buy into this. They're like, we can heat our cars for free, essentially, with this friction heater. So it takes off extremely quickly. Um, throughout 1906 and 1907, he's traveling around. He's selling this product. There's 
articles about the government of Japan is interested in purchasing these, that this is going to heat your home for free. Like, it, it's a revolutionizing thing. Uh, I believe so. <laughs> um, so we found this in our archives recently. Um, this was actually donated in the 70s to the St. Joseph Museum. Um, wasn't part of the Black Archives donations originally. Um, so this is for the 1906 Negro Industrial Exposition and Tri-State Fair, which was held here in St. Joseph at Lake Contrary. Um, so Charles got together with a lot of prominent African Americans from Kansas and Iowa and set up their, our own exposition here in town. Uh, they had a day, a white day, so everyone could come out and see the inventions. Um, this is the only images that I know of, of Bella Baker up here, Miss Lola Baker. Um, remember she was Ellington whenever they incorporated. She got a divorce in 1906, so she's back to using her maiden name. So that's his daughter. And then this is a picture of his wife. Uh, Carrie disappears, um, and honestly, I have a, a lot of trouble tracking Charles himself as he's moving across the country. I think they may have been separated around the 1900s, but I'm not sure. I can't confirm or deny that. Um, but again, they're using the same image um, from the Bodhi photographer here in St. Joseph demonstrating the uh, invention itself. This down here is actually a streetcar here in town that they hooked the heater up to and used. And then it has his cottage home and his factory. His cottage home, if you look back at those city directories, is 2616 Locust Street, which is still there today. So you can kind of compare them. It's really dark, I'm sorry. But it's the same structure, just that roof is flattened for some reason, and they lost the side of the building. So as far as I know, that's still standing. And this is 611 Francis Street. And if you look at the factory, it's pretty much just a square building. It's the same outline. I don't know if it's the same building. I'm assuming it is, but that's the Modoc building today. So this is the patent for the actual friction heater. Um, this is actually patented in 1911 in Canada. I can't find the U.S. patent. I don't know if you actually filed one or not. Um, but again, it's more refined version of uh, the design, which you see in the main picture. Um, here it's hooked up to the engine to the side. I think with the design, they were planning it to be hooked up at the bottom here. Um, so, yeah, and they still use radiators. Like, um, the, the issue is the fuel itself. Um, and so how it kind of goes is, as long as you can turn this rotor, then this will heat your house for free. The turning of the rotor is where the things get kind of tricky. Whether you're using electricity to, to fuel that, whether you're using um, f diesel or what have you, and I think what probably ended up happening was big business ran them out, because pretty much. So this being the original photo that we have of them, um, I've been, you know, delving into it. This is at the Library of Congress, um, and it just says the start of the friction union um, device. Sorry, uh, start of superheating union is the only thing listed on it. And so we were trying to figure out who this other fella is, um, and through that I was doing research in ancestry, trying to find the family, um, and I found a family tree that had Charles and uh, Carrie listed on it. Um, because they are the descendants of Peter Baker. So this is Peter Baker here, um, and we're fairly certain that he is the other figure in this. So it's Charles and his brother, Peter. This is his whole family, and they actually have the other side of this picture. So there was a second photo taken, which I did not realize until I contacted them. I said, hey, we have these photos. You know, Can you help us identify them? And she says, well, I actually have the other one of that, and sent me this. So. Um, Again, this is probably Peter here, Charles, demonstrating it. We don't know if these are investors or who um, these folks are, but now we have the option of trying to figure out who everyone is. Um, also in 1907, he went to um, the Jamestown Exposition. This was the Negro building. Um, he used the steam uh, friction heater to heat coffee that he served to demonstrate how it was used. Um, this is an article about the uh, exposition here at Lake Contrary. These are some uh, notable um, farmers in the area. There's a rucker from Andrew County in there, which is interesting. Um, so then some other articles. In 1911, like I said, I lose track of him uh, after the invention uh, takes off. I, I know he's in Detroit and possibly Chicago around those times, but he doesn't show up in city directories. Um, in 1911, he hired a man to help sell 
the invention, and this is where things kind of come off the rails, I think. Um, if you remember the original article that I was saying that had his bio, which has some uh, inconsistencies in it, that's the first part of this Thomas W. Brown trying to sell the invention, essentially. So the rest of this is just him saying, like, it works. It's great. You should buy it from me. Um, he was also uh, had the rights to sell an Augustine automatic uh, engine, which was a Canadian invention. And so he tried to mirror the two together. You use the engine to fuel the heater, so I'm getting money off of both of this. Um, so he, he's very adamant to try to sell all of these. Um, so the article reads kind of strange. Um, he's just, he's a very forceful presence. Um, but Charles continues to uh, be active in the community. He continues to sell his product. Um, there's articles in Utah and California looking for salesmen to go sell, sell this idea across the country. Um, in 1906, he got his driver's license uh, on the day that Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation, and he made a speech about it. Um, in 1910, you see he's uh, pushing for free libraries in every colored school across America that his company will, will pay for because he's made a lot of money selling his invention. Um, whether or not that came to be, I don't know. I doubt it. Um, but especially the country school, the rural districts, he says. So he, he, he really wants to help uh, raise society, help, uh, you know, help citizens. Um, over here in 1914, he writes in our local paper, uh, talking about not allowing African Americans into the five cent shows, which is kind of ironic because however many years, 50 years later, that's what we get Kelsey Brashears fighting for uh, African Americans to be able to go to theaters. And so this is him, you know, 50 years before saying the same things. Why are we being forced out of this? You know, there's places like the Tootle Theater, the Lyceum, they allow African Americans in. It's just up to the will of whoever runs the show. So this, this isn't right, he's calling it out, but again, we know it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, 1910, uh, like I said, I can't find Charles. I did find Lula Bell, she is down at the bottom, um, and she's living with her aunt, Ellen Carringer. Um, so again, no mention of her mother, no mention of Charles. Um, she's like 28 years old, living with her aunt. In St. Joseph, yeah, yep. Um, and then, in 1924, Charles is living in Chicago. Um, he falls ill and he comes back to St. Joseph to live with Lula. Um, she's gotten remarried at this point to a man named Daniel Harding. He was a doctor in town, or Hardy, sorry. Um, so he's living with her for two years uh, and then he passes away in 1926 of pneumonia. Um, and so that's where the trail kind of ends. He came back yep. To mm -hmm. Came back to St. Joseph and passed away here. Mm -hmm. And so, um, I don't know what happened to Friction Heater. Obviously, we don't have free energy right now, so whether or not it got beaten out either by uh, white businessmen or by big business with uh, fuel sources, I don't know. But here we have the um, boom exhibit, which we just opened at the, Saint jo or at the East Hills Mall. Um, this is what it looks like. These pop-up banners are from other states in Missouri, and we just finished the interactives and stuff. Um, for the St. Joseph section, so feel free to come check it out. Yes? Question uh -huh. here. If the electric motor spun, created friction, inside the radiator, was that oil? And that heated up and got hot? It's supposed to be water, technically. Pardon? It's supposed to have been water, is what they claimed, at least. They have oil heaters now working on the same principle. Right. Is this a uh, uh, public place to go to the day? Yep, it's, it's, you can go there anytime. It's at the East Hills Mall. It's open for free, so... Yep, feel free to go check it out. Yes? Carringer. I think it's Carringer. There's no N in it. I keep trying to put an N in there. Two R's, yep. Yep. I can try to find. We have a family here. I don't doubt, because like I said, there's, I'll have to go way back, but there's three generations of it here, you know, um, in Andrew County in the 1870s, if I can get to it. Yeah, so there's Luis up here, who's a single mother of all these kids. There's um, who's possibly, there's a Samuel who's either a son or a nephew. And then there's Christopher who went by Chrisley. And he's the one who shows up in 1860 as a freeman. And again, he has a large family as well. Um, so it's highly likely there's still descendants around. Okay, could you back it up a little bit? 
Yeah. Locust Street, 2616. As far as I know, I haven't driven by it, but it's near where I live. It looks like a steward's house. Guess what? I'm, does the family know that? I doubt it. Huh? Probably not. It is. It is, Gary. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. They probably don't know that. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to make sure, like, double checking what it looked like, and it full on double checks. So. Any other questions? Yes. Do you know where Charles got his education? It says in the article, um, I didn't write it down. He went to, crud. Going to have to try to read really fuzzy uh, thing, but. Franklin College, it says. Uh, I think that's in Illinois, if I'm remembering correctly. <laughs> this is 1911. Uh, you can find this online on Google Books uh, if you search for Michigan manufacturer. Um, it was originally published in a newspaper, and then they um, bound the newspaper into a periodical that you can find online. So you can find it on newspapers.com too. Um, so that the, this is, was written by that Thomas W. Brown, I think. Because um, this is showing off that you can use it to heat your tea or your coffee. I'm assuming this is probably from that Jamestown exposition in 1907, but I'm not sure. And I don't know who the lady is, but this was his invention. He used it to do that, yeah. Oh, and it heats the water? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and whenever they had the expo here in town, uh, there's the first quote in that article. The registers would go in your home, uh, essentially in each room. You would have a register that would heat the room, essentially. Just created steam heat around. Um, the uh, the article about the local one, at the very beginning is a quote from some prominent white folk. Someone, yeah. In, in Canada. They said that he did sell it in Canada, but again, like he said, he made sure he maintained possession of that patent his entire life. Um, so whether or not it got sold and was continued to use or adapted or what, but um, yes. Did he invent other things that didn't do as well, or? Um, not that I know of. Again, that signaling thing kind of came out of nowhere. I didn't know that he had worked on that. Um, so, and it seems like the same kind of system that we still use. Um, but there's no mention of him in the history books of that being his invention. Whether or not somebody else adapted it, um, you know, patents. There's tons of patents being produced at this time, um, so it's really hard to track, and especially this kind of corporate history of finding out, you know, where his company was at, because if he was still having the factory here in town and selling things in Chicago, was he making them here and shipping them out? Did he have a business in Chicago? He had an office in Chicago, but that goes away. I can't find, like, keep track of that over the years, so it's, it's really hard to track how his career fleshed out after well, the end. The right. And he apparently got um, the Goulds, who were the, the robber barons uh, back then. Their daughter was really infatuated with this uh, invention. It mentions her in this article as well. So he, he had a lot of contracts, I think, with a lot of the train companies, whether or not they actually got implemented. Because um, the articles make it sound like this is a done deal. This is happening. All the cars are going to be heated by this friction heater. And then I don't know what happens to it, <laughs> whether they just stop talking about it or right. Gary? Uh, what time was the uh, signaling thing? What signaling was 1903, and then he switched to the friction heater in 1904. So. Because I was asking uh, earlier, maybe 20, 30 years earlier, Garrett Morgan was another black inventor. Mm -hmm. He was invented the airbrake for the railroad system. Really? So I was trying to decide that. Yeah. If it's connected, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Paula. Uh, you said you think you know where he's buried? So in his death certificate, it says that he's going to be buried in Savannah. We can assume it's that family plot, but like I said, Abraham's the only stone in that cemetery. His daughter, um, like I said, I'm able to track her a little bit better um, eventually. Uh, she passed away in the 30s and is actually buried at the city cemetery, so she doesn't have a marker either, which is kind of a 
tragic end to her. They, she never had kids, so that line dies out. That's why I was amazed to find Peter having family later on. So. Anyone else? Right, thank you.